think in the interest of time, we should start. So, um, dear audience here in the room, dear online audience that's also joining, this event's being streamed. I warmly welcome us to our conversation on science diplomacy today. And um, science diplomacy, it sounds kind of uh, easy, I mean, it's understandable, right, what it is. But I think on like a second glance, it's probably much more to it than we think and that we know of. And um, therefore, uh, I'm very, very happy that we've been able to recruit this really distinguished, distinguished panel here with us, absolute experts on science diplomacy and people who actually know what, they, what science diplomacy is and are living this every day. And um, yeah, I'm hoping for a very interesting, lively discussion also with all of you in the audience. And um, yeah, I think, well, no, before we start, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm Luisa Wengtson. I am the head of Berlin Science Week. I'll be moderating um, the panel. And before we start with the discussion, discussion, um, some housekeeping um, topics. <laughs> so for the online audience, especially, you can also join the discussion. We have a Slido. Um, there. So if you have any questions, please post them in Slido and we will relay those uh, during the Q&A to the panelists. So that's it. And now let's start. So who do we have here? <laughs> uh, we have a very distinguished panel. Um, so a very warm welcome first to Science Senator Dr. Ina Tribora. Thank you for being here. We have uh, with me also Vadim Nagayanchuk. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Nagayanchuk, sorry, okay. Uh, the third secretary of the uh, Embassy of Ukraine with us. We have Hila Engelhardt, head of Global Agenda and Scientific Affairs of the Embassy of Israel. We also have Dr. Andreas Kosmida, the executive director of the Falling Walls Foundation. And last but not least, Viviana Brazil, the CEO of the Body Bear Berlin. Okay, so as I uh, already started uh, with uh, my introduction, science diplomacy, uh, the first thing I would like to know is actually what is it exactly and how is it being done? What does it actually mean in practice when we talk about science diplomacy? And this is this, this question I would like direct uh, first to our embassy representative. So. I know, Hila, maybe you would like to start. How, how do you do science diplomacy? In normal days, we uh, connect uh, between scientists and uh, uh, between scientific organizations, and we form the, uh, most of all the basic frameworks for their cooperation. Um, we also uh, communicate uh, what we are doing as a country, and we, uh, if needed, uh, clarify uh, the basic values and the um, procedures we have in the government to take care of issues that concern today everybody in science, like IP, etc. Uh, but I have to say that science diplomacy is uh, not done uh, only in embassies. Actually, it's mostly done not by embassies, but by scientists themselves. And I would like to um, maybe use the opportunity to, uh, first of all, um, dedicate maybe my appearance here today uh, to a very dear person who uh, on the 7th of uh, October in the Hamas attack now uh, in Israel uh, was kidnapped, abducted uh, by the Hamas and is still held hostage in uh, Gaza. Her name is Shoshana Haran and she was actually uh, uh, with nine more members of her family uh, on her farm. She's a scientist uh, and her specialty is agriculture. She um, was researching for a very long time uh, agricultural uh, produce and uh, seeds. And um, after many years, she also set up a, an NGO called Fair Planet. Uh, this NGO develops seeds uh, that uh, um, are of quality, and she has been working all throughout her uh, many years as a scientist in Africa with very poor communities, uh, including, of course, also Muslim com communities, Christian communities, and others, 
to help them uh, raise and grow crops that are uh, more viable, uh, more resistant to uh, um, weather and, uh, and disease of plants, and that uh, um, could bring them, them more prosperity than some of the seeds that have been used in the past that weren't of such good quality. Uh, two of the nine uh, have been confirmed uh, murdered, but the rest of them are still held by the Hamas in Gaza. And uh, I, of course, pray together with the rest of my people and many friends across the world for their safe return. People like her and other scientists uh, who just you know, cooperate across boundaries in Israel, in Germany, and in many other countries are the real ambassadors and real uh, uh, diplomats of scientific cooperation. Uh, thank you, Hila. I'm uh, really um, I'm sorry. It's really difficult to say something after this. Um, so um, I just give the, the word to Fadim Nagayachuk. Sorry. Um, how is what does science diplomacy mean to you, and how is it being lived? Uh, <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I fully agree that diplomats are not the ones who are doing the main science diplomacy. It's scientists who are the science ambassadors. Uh, I took this term somewhere from your notes, I guess. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and uh, today, I think our Ukrainian main goal is to <clears throat> get our science ambassadors heard. Today we have this window for opportunity and we finally don't uh, have like false ambassadors claiming to present Ukraine, but actually just taking our agenda like uh, <clears throat> historians who uh, tried to, Russian historians, their voice which Oh, their voice was much more heard than the Ukrainian one. And it's not only about history, it's about every, every science. So that's it, I guess. That's her stuff here, so. so scientists as the ambassadors of science diplomacy. Um, this is actually something I had on my, uh, one of my questions here. And this is something for uh, Frau Chibora, actually. Um, because Berlin is a, such a science diaspora. There are so many diasporas here. There are so many scientists from all over the world working together. Is there something that Berlin State doing for that? Like, is, is there something um, that's, that's, is it a something that Berlin is also utilizing in any way for, uh, for uh, furthering international collaborations? Or like, what kind of frameworks are there? Um, is this a topic at all, <laughs> all these international people? <laughs> Sorry. Sure, it's a topic. Uh, we, we are doing a lot, I think. First, um, I visited an excellence cluster uh, last week, um, contestations uh, of the liberal script, and it's um, uh, many people, many scientists um, cooperate with people in, in many countries looking for these who make these contestations against the liberal scripts, trying to, to speak to them, to, to cooperate also with these people. And um, so that's a um, really good, um, uh, yes, really good to, to understand conflicts and to understand um, how um, these contestations work all over the world, also um, in Berlin. Um, on the other hand, we um, have some money given to the Einstein Stiftung. Um, um, it's a little bit my idea, uh, was it for um, some years ago, um, when scientists uh, got under threat in Turkey and in other countries because I knew uh, the situation from Serbia and from the Balkans. And uh, so we said, okay, we want to be a safe harbor for scientists under threat from all over the world. And we, um, not, we want not only to be a safe harbor, but we want to, to um, give these opportunities to um, um, make the research here in Berlin uh, when they have to leave their countries. And uh, so we have done a little bit. Um, there are other programs to, to, um, for these people, and we try, um, because it's, it's so necessary that this research um, doesn't break 
that these um, competences, uh, we, we don't lose these competences in all these topics uh, scientists um, make, uh, make the research on. So, um, Berlin as a safe harbor, but also as a way to enhance the, actually the excellence research to bring all these people together and give them possibilities to work together. And uh, this is now a question to Andrea. So, Falling Walls Foundation is, um, has in its mission to break the walls to um, you know, any barriers that are there to scientific discovery and to promote international corporations. Why does it need an NGO? to do that because Falling Walls is the mothership of the Berlin Science Week and also the one that pays my salary. So it's, a, it's another provocative question, but. Well, everything needs somebody to take care of things, right? Before I start out, I want to um, express my gratitude to, to Ihila to joining this panel. And um, as um, Luisa mentioned, Falling Walls is celebrating the day of the fall of the Berlin Wall, but the 9th of November is also the commemoration day of the Reichskristallnacht. And 85 years ago, people started smearing David stars on doors, and this is happening again in this city, and Jewish life is under attack, and you have the courage to be with us, which is fantastic, but all of us, we need to remember our responsibility here in this country, in this very city of Berlin, that this kind of activity cannot stand, and anti-Semitism has no room among civilized people. <clears throat> But coming, coming back to, to convening and bringing people together and um, what the mission of Falling Walls also includes, obviously uh, we are dedicated to this international spirit, to, to, to the idea to bring visionaries together from all cultures, from all religions, from all peoples, uh, to, to join forces in coming up with brilliant new ideas, how we can we shape this planet in the future. It's a very, very high, uh, uh, stretched goal, we have to be really strong, we have to assemble over a thousand thinkers, Nobel laureates, CEOs, uh, people from European Union and other governments, uh, because once you have so much brain power together and, uh, uh, and impulses from all different fields, you can come up with something great. And we as a people uh, on this planet, we need to work together and not fight each other among, ab about some, some, some ideology, but we have to think together what can we do um, to take care of the water crisis, to, to tackle climate change, uh, and to work for a bright, brilliant, optimistic future and one day fly to the stars together. Um, so after these ideas are kind of like crystallized out, how does science diplomacy actually work? Uh, me, myself, um, before I drifted into science management, I was a particle physicist. So, and um, when you join a lab like CERN or uh, other big institutions, um, you have people from all over the world, from all nations. And they're not like completely negligent of their heritage or their religion or anything, but there's a mutual respect because you do something meaningful together. And if you do something meaningful together, you have to respect the person you're doing it with. And this is the key to, to how, how the lab coats bring peace, because I'm forced to not only talk with you about science, but we will talk about your kids, we will talk about your country, we will talk about your history. And this leads to a lot of understanding. And if I take it one step further and I build a big machine together or fly to the moon together, all the industries from all these different um, uh, countries, they will have to work together too. Okay, so it's not just lab codes, right? It's everybody who participates in some kind. And it's, uh, now imagine building like a big particle accelerator. There's components from all over the world. And all these engineers and all these salespeople or even uh, people very down uh, in, the, in, the, in the working rooms, they, they get in contact with other people as well. So I know it always sounds a little, cheap to say, let's talk to each other, but uh, it still remains true. And if science brings people together, brings good ideas and brings the room to, to make these exchanges possible, then science diplomacy works. And we as Falling Walls try to contribute at least a little bit to that. Uh, Viviana, um, Buddy Bear has a totally different approach for promoting tolerance and intercultural understanding. You work with symbols, you work with art, uh, how does it work? Like, how is the body bear contributing to the science diplomacy? Um, well, I think it's not, 
it seems to be uh, very different, but I think the, the common idea between science and art and culture is that different, no matter, not <clears throat> no matter uh, what, what your nationality, what your religion is, you come together, you, you, you bring a new perspective, and this, this new perspective helps driving change, maybe changing your perception, changing, um, yeah, neglecting also um, maybe any, any uh, prejudice you, you could have. And what you say, I, I totally agree with you that um, I think starting, it, it has to be, a, there has to be a starting point and you can, you can use or science, but also art to work together to, to um, collaborate. And that brings um, this, this uh, interdisciplinary work brings people together and brings new ideas and maybe could also help to, to bring yeah, more tolerance, definitely, but also peace in the world because um, you start, yeah, you start working together and maybe the only or where could be where where could art maybe add something differently uh, is that art has maybe and, and culture and maybe um, especially now by the, the body bears they can evoke emotions and these emotions help to to work together so i think it's not so different it's it's just that art and science uh, should work together a bit closer, I think, yeah. And that's why we have an Arts and Science Forum during the Berlin Science Week. <laughs> um, okay, so that sounds all, you know, it sounds all wonderful. Um, so basically what we need is more scientists in the same room working together on one project, right? And then everything is solved, or? <laughs> <laughs> Now, I mean, not everybody is a scientist, not everybody can be a scientist, but of course we all profit from scientific discoveries and advances. But I'm just wondering if that would be so easy, just put everybody working on the same thing, we would have done that already. So are there any challenges or barriers that you encounter in this bringing, well, just even scientists together? Is there anything there that's hindering it? And maybe for Tribora, maybe you have... Um, when you try to get all these um, programs on the way, is it difficult? Sure, it is. Um, but I, I'm, I'm thinking about if it's true that only scientists work together, because um, um, I'm an archaeologist, and when archaeologists go in the field, they work not only with other scientists, but they work in the field, they work with many people, and I think it's not only archaeologists do this, um, they um, work in the country, they work with the people, they uh, talk to them, not only to scientists, but um, they learn a lot about um, these communities, and I think it's uh, my for example, biologists or ecologists or every scientist um, who does work in, in foreign countries and cooperates with um, scientists from foreign countries um, also has is connected to people in these countries and and learns a lot a lot and so um, I think it's it's um, very important to fund these um, activities and these cooperations, but uh, in the first, it's, it's the universities, it's the institutions who decide where to work and which topics to, to, uh, to make the research on. And we can fund it, and um, we can, um, but it's not, not uh, it's more um, the federal uh, ministers, the federals uh, who have to do um, it to, to um, um, yes, um, overcome the borders. Um, for example, of laws and, and possibilities to work together. Mm. Can, can, can I add to that about the challenges? Uh, I really liked your explanation here, and I want to uh, maybe highlight it from, from, a, different, uh, from a different angle. Um, I, I always see the, the very challenge is um, each nation or in each municipality, they have their, their resources, their funding. And if I want to do something cross borders, I need funding cross borders, right? So in, in, in Jordan, for example, there's the Sesame Synchrotron. 
a fantastic opportunity from people from Arabic states and, uh, and the state of Israel to come together. I think it's Jordan, Turkey, Bahrain, Cyprus, Israel working together. Even Iran. Even Iran. And it's funded by the UNESCO, right? So, uh, or partially funded by UNESCO. So what, what we need to consider is what kind of supranational or international bodies could be empowered to specifically call for cross-border corporations, right? So, because obviously you need to keep your, your, your funding together. The same goes for the Federal Republic of Germany. Everybody has a little bit for international activities, but it's always really hard to actually do it because you need to get all these different governments on the same page. And if the governments don't really like each other, then there's no real room for science diplomacy, right? So that's, that would be something that I would uh, suggest uh, in the future to, to maybe think about ways to, to have a more international approach on things. Maybe I can come in on this and say that uh, uh, I connect to the fact that uh, there needs to be political will on part of the governments for uh, cross-border uh, cooperation to happen, uh, not only in terms of funding. Uh, for example, in Israel, when scientists want to reach out and work together with Jordanians and uh, Egyptian scientists, even though uh, we have peace agreements with these countries for many years now, uh, it's very difficult to make this happen because uh, uh, the scientists on the Jordanian and Egyptian side uh, will be quite apprehensive about working with Israelis in their societies as a whole. Uh, this is not easily accepted, to say the least. And uh, plainly, they sometimes fear to do anything like that because uh, they may, might not be safe, uh, them and their families. This is very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, it makes the uh, project of Sesame, which is actually uh, heavily German uh, also, uh, because the uh, uh, Sesame synchrotron came from uh, Helm Helmholtz, I believe. In uh, Berlin. <laughs> originally. Yeah. Uh, but, um, uh, but it really underlines the importance of education and this cycle, that if you educate people for tolerance, uh, they can actually take this step forward, which will then also create more tolerance. And uh, it's a cycle. And I want, in this um, respect, to mention the Abram Accords, uh, which were a significant site and vendor for us uh, in the Middle East, with the, uh, especially the United Arab Emirates, which has a very strong drive and motivation to uh, develop itself uh, scientifically. It actually wants to reach the moon as uh, uh, with taking this uh, metaphor that was used before me. And uh, in this, they really see the, the value of uh, cooperating with Israel. And one of the things that are interesting that I heard a couple of months ago about what enabled the United Arab, Arab Emirates to take this first step of breaking the non-normalization circle of the Arab countries with Israel was that they, uh, previous to this step, for at least one year, if not two, had a very deep education campaign all across the board, through their media, in their schools. They, uh, were, they did this whole program about tolerance. Without even mentioning Israel, uh, they just did a program about tolerance and educated people for tolerance. And this is crucial, what we see um, today, um, what we understand is that uh, this is not about Israeli-Arab or any political conflict. Right. This is about people who want to construct a society, a viable society, a living one, much like the one here in Germany, uh, in vibrant Berlin, uh, much like the one in Israel. Uh, and the other side is not... Uh, Arabs or Israelis. It's not Israelis or Palestinians. The other side are a very radical, fundamentalist Islamic groups that use terrorism, like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, like Hamas, uh, to uh, uh, and, and attack the very foundations of our societies. So the, the attack is not against an army. It, the attack is against people who may be scientists, they may be artists, they may be um, uh, NGO uh, people, innovation people, just plain people dancing in the desert. Uh, and it, it 
aims at the very infrastructure of our society and our values. And, and this, is, this is, I think, what is important to understand and connecting to uh, your message, which I was thankful for at the beginning. I want to also say it's so important in Germany now and all over the world for scientific institutions to, and for, for academic institutions to uh, stand up and have moral clarity about this and guide young students uh, with a moral campus to be able to distinguish between the complex issues around this and take a clear moral stand to protect everyone, everyone on the campuses. Israelis, Jews, Muslims, Palestinians, everyone has to feel safe. Everyone has to be able to participate. In Israel, we have Israeli scientists who are Jewish and Arab and Muslim and Christians, and they are all working together. It's not always easy, but it's always important. And now is the time for us to hear every leader of every institution in their own institution speaking up for tolerance, speaking up for uh, the, safe, uh, the, safe, the safety of all the people so that they can continue working on the challenges humanity has today in climate and food security and every issue, physics, chemistry, everything. This is actually uh, reminds me, thank you very much for the statement. Uh, it reminds me a bit of, um, you know, when we had, uh, it's a totally different situation, but um, this attack on democracy in many different ways that's happening, we're seeing um, in different places. So it can be, uh, you know, like during the COVID, the, the whole uh, anti-vaccination movement, um, threatening people who are wearing masks, or just basically just based on misinformation on sometimes maybe just plain lack of scientific literacy, but also media literacy, uh, education, I mean, all this, it's, it's not, um, it can take many forms, this attack on democracy, right? So I'm just wondering, um, because now in Ukraine, the, the situation is a bit, I mean, I don't want to compare in things, but there is a situation that's just as um, dramatic. Um, there you don't have the, the religious polarization or any of that. So do you also consider this being an attack on democracy? Like how, how would you want to maybe add to this? Uh, yes, of course, it was attack on democracy. It was attack on all spheres of our lives. So Russia uh, destroyed uh, some scientific buildings, many universities in Ukraine and so on and so far. Cultural institutions, uh, they are all aimed uh, for their missile attacks. Uh, 5,000 Ukrainian scientists left Ukraine after 24th of February. So they've created kind of scientific diaspora they never wanted to create. Uh, we still hope, we believe that these people will return uh, and uh, contribute to the recovery of Ukraine. Um, it was attack on democracy and it was not only attack on Ukraine. Uh, and sometimes, uh, I guess, uh, you shall be, uh, let, it, let me say, uh, you shall always uh, be aware that scientific cooperation can lead you, can be tricky, can lead you not there where you think you are going to. Uh, especially when you're, uh, the part you are trying to cooperate with has totally different goals. Uh, so Russia and Germany, they did cooperate in many ways, in scientific ways. Take, for example, Nord Stream. I guess it was kind of a masterpiece of scientific thought. Uh, but for Russia, it was from the very beginning just a weapon, uh, which it turned to be after all. Um, and uh, my thought here is just Think who are you cooperating with? What aim you are? Uh, what you aim you have? And be sure that the aim you have is the aim the other side has. When you are cooperating within a democratic world, everything will be fine. Okay. So how do? Yeah. Science uh, 
can contribute to a democratic world, definitely, uh, not alone. I, I was thinking maybe going to the topic of science communication, actually, because, um, you know, science scientists do cooperate. And, I mean, we already talked about that. But this bringing society, so it's not just education. It's also a matter of, like, how do you actually bring this idea of that the world, like, we think is desirable at least, <laughs> is actually a good one that everybody should work on. Um, do you have any ideas or you know, examples of initiatives that may be doing just that? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, does anybody else want to go? <laughs> you go ahead, I can add. <laughs> uh, let me give a, a phenomenal example. You know, uh, I'm sitting here as a representative of the state of Israel in Germany. All of my grandparents were born in Germany. They all immigrated to Israel in the 1930s because of the Nazi regime here. And, uh, and the Holocaust is such a tough piece of history that Israel and Germany holds together as a, a collective trauma for both of our nations. Uh, the trauma of the oppressor and the trauma of the uh, victim, both very, very tough traumas. And I think that uh, in the reconstruction of, in the healing process of both of our societies from this terrible trauma that might take, we don't even know how many decades or hundreds of years, uh, science has played such a pivotal role. In fact, the scientific relations between Israel and Germany preceded the diplomatic ones. Mm -hmm. It was Max Planck then and the Weizmann Institute, both beacons of excellence in research uh, with Nobel, Nobel, Nobel Prize winners and, and many really amazing research going on uh, in, in those centers, in the centers of Max Planck and in Israel. And, um, the, their ability to build programs has really, and then also for others to follow in their steps. Uh, today we have the, Israel, uh, uh, the German Israeli fund uh, that funds research. We have uh, Helmholtz has an office in Israel. Fraunhofer has several topical platforms in Israel. There is so much excellent research that is being conducted by scientists and researchers from both countries working on it together bilaterally, that is a country with country, and also multilaterally in the framework of the Horizon Europe uh, framework pro research uh, program. Um, and, and so definitely I have to say yes, uh, positive action is possible, it's necessary, but it's also possible and it's proven to be effective. Uh, and Again, and I do apologize, these are such tough days for Israel, and I bring here examples that I know are very tough. But in Israel, we had a wonderful um, science edu education uh, researcher. She started actually by just being a teacher. She's a chemist, she was a chemist, and uh, uh, she taught in high schools in Israel, and then she started researching with the Weizmann Institute. Uh, and her, the topic of her research was scientific education. And she was trying to develop new ways to engage young people uh, in science, uh, to make it more accessible for them, even online and not only online. Her name was Marcel Freilich Kaplun. Uh, she, she lived for 40 years on kibbutz, in Kibbutz Be'eri, and uh, on the 7th of October she was uh, uh, murdered. But uh, look at the reaction of the uh, Weizmann Institute. Uh, she was a member of, the, uh, of an American uh, organization that is like a global, um, um, a global organization for science education. And uh, they have a yearly conference. Uh, this organization, uh, like many actually in the US, uh, uh, their reaction to what happened in Israel uh, was, let's say, uh, not clear enough, I will put it diplomatically. And the Weizmann Institute decided uh, that as a constructive step, what they are going to do is give uh, yearly stipends for doctoral students to come to the conference of this body, 
to finance people that are not Israelis from other countries in the world on the name of Marcel Freilich Kaplun and to her memory and of another uh, science educator that uh, was also murdered the same day. So you take the, the, the challenge that we are challenged with is to take uh, the reality that we have even in the darkest moments and the most difficult times and find a way to move it, to, to work with this material and move it towards constructive, positive directions. And it doesn't matter where you do it, if you are working on the Israeli, German uh, uh, healing process, if you are working on inside Israel, as I said, between uh, Jews and Muslims in Israel, if you are working with Israel and other countries in the Middle East, and it doesn't matter also the scale, if you are doing it with millions of people, uh, like Shoshana Haran did in Africa, or if you are doing it with, you know, two people or ten people. It's just important to know that you are contributing to making the future a better place. That's beautiful. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that you, you mentioned the, the, the first visit of, of or official visit of the, of the German science system after the Second World War in, in Israel. And it was 1959, as you, as you explained, it was members from the Max Planck Society that visited Israel. And I find it always, when I hear, to hear this story, I find it extremely hard to imagine the feeling of these ambassadors. There was no diplomatic relations, as, as you said it. It was the first time officially that somebody from Germany after the Holocaust came to Israel. I myself, I cannot put myself mentally in this, in this perspective, right? I mean, they were most certainly not greeted very nicely by everyone. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there was a lot of people booing them, and uh, it may be even worse. Uh, but look what happened. And um, I want to come back to my point that I made earlier. There was some meaningful interaction. These people sat down together, they realized, okay, we have this huge load of history, uh, uh, guilt and, and, and horrible things, there's a lot of wounds that did not heal yet, but we have an agenda, we have a couple of things that we might do together to the greater good. Okay, so they had a, a meaningful interaction, they came together. Or to make it even more bluntly, if you all consider where do you meet your friends, or where did you meet your girlfriend, or your husband, or something like that. Every once in a while, it's the university, or it was even the school, or maybe it's even more mundane than that, some kind of club or choir or wherever, right? Because there you have a forum, there you have time to do something meaningful with other people, thus getting to know them. And I, again, I think this is the very core of science diplomacy and why it works so well, because in science, basically, well, not every time, but a lot of uh, occasions where scientists meet, there's something meaningful will come about, right? So that's why science diplomacy might be a very efficient form and maybe a little bit more, um, let's say, structured or goal-driven than, than other, let's say, just more touristy ex exchange events. But I think at the very core, uh, as soon as smart people who are willing, working together on something that's interesting for both sides, good things will come from it. And that's science diplomacy. That's what we should push for. Um, I would like to add something. Um, of, of course, I'm not a scientist, um, but I'm here for, for Body by Berlin, for our initiative. And maybe I would like to add something, because you were talking about science communication. I think um, communication starts earlier than for, for children also um, already. Maybe it's not called, or we cannot call it science then. But um, <clears throat> I think it's very important to to really um, yeah, start earlier in, 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 the, in the child days where, um, where you can really try to, to, to fight against prejudice. And that's maybe I can bring the idea of, of, of the United uh, Body Bears, which is practically um, 150 bears standing, each of, each of them representing one country. And each of them, um, yeah, was painted by an artist of that respective country. And uh, so the idea or the message is, and I think this is important for all of us, so basically we are, if everyone looks differently, but at the end we are all the same, and we stand together and we stand for 
yeah, a, a lighter vision of, of a peaceful world. And I think it's, I mean, it's so, it, it's so difficult in these days because we have so many conflicts all over the world. And we have here, uh, yeah, um, the Ukrainian and the Israeli um, um, yeah, representatives. And we are so, I mean, we are, we, I cannot say, or we all are so sorry, and um, we are very grateful that you came here. But I think even then we need, I mean, we need to have some hope and we need to be positive also. And that's why I think let's start, let's start to work on, yeah, for our children and our, for our future to really help um, understanding each other and yeah, stand for, for uh, tolerance and let's really start already as soon as possible and not, and not only once we are adult and maybe ha are full of prejudices. Yeah, that's the real scrapping. <laughs> and we have so many meaningful things to do. I mean, the climate crisis, the all kinds of crises. Um, I would like to open the floor to the public. So um, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm Vijay. I'm one of the journalist uh, fellows of uh, Berlin Science Week. Ah. So I have the question to the whole panel, but specifically to the delegates from the embassies. So uh, universities in Israel, Tel Aviv University, or Weizmann Institute, as you mentioned, it's known for international collaborations. And we have seen after the Russian um, attack on Ukraine, universities in Ukraine and other European countries, they came together in terms of collaboration. But we also learn that um, there is a um, site-taking mentality even among scientists. You know, there was a Twitter row when a professor uh, apparently sounded like sympathizing with uh, the Hamas and he was being cornered or targeted. So when we are talking about science diplomacy, I think we also have to think about scientists as human beings ourselves. And we are prone to error or bias. So when scientists take sides, for example, when scientists um, run a conference, they bar scientists from Russia, even though they are against the attack on Ukraine, they are barred from registration. So how does science diplomacy work in you know, such scenarios where there is a side-taking mentality? Uh, well, I don't think that science, as any other sphere of life, is a political. Everything is political our days. And you need to take side. You do science like not for nothing. You do it for something. If you do it for a world to be a better place, just do it for a world to be a better place with people who do it for a world to be a better place. I guess taking sides is not bad. Anybody else who has a different opinion on the panel? Uh, I, I, I uh, can, can relate to this in the sense that uh, when something happens that is a brutal attack on the foundations that we are lean, leaning on, you must take a stand. Silence is not an option. And I want to connect this to, uh, in answer to your question, to the importance of, uh, um, of the leadership of the scientific institutions. When uh, there is a person inside a scientific institution that is taking a side uh, in um, the, the, it is up to the leadership of the institution to pro provide the moral compass and the clarity of where the boundaries are. People uh, can, of course, express different views, and it's very important to really guard the fabric of the relationships, even when people have different opinions. Uh, the heads of the scientific institutions in Israel, of the top ones, the Israeli Science Foundation uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, two more, 
actually sent a letter in the last days to the heads of the scientific com uh, communi communities, organizations in other places in the world, including Germany. And in this letter, one of the things they addressed uh, is the importance of this fabric inside Israel that I was mentioning earlier. The Muslims and Jews and Arabs and, and, and uh, Israelis working together in the, this research field. It's very important for us to uh, maintain uh, the possibility to all be as one. And we are one. You know, when, we, when the attacks of the 7th of October happened, it's not only Jewish people who were murdered. People who were murdered of different nationalities who happened to be there, and also Arabs, uh, Bedouins who were there. Uh, even when they shouted out, I'm Arab and spoke in Arabic, they were equally murdered and kidnapped. So uh, it's, it's, there is a limit to what you can uh, do. And, I think that in the case uh, of uh, um, at least of what, it, of what is happening today in the world uh, with fundamentalist, fundamentalist Islam and terrorism, uh, and, and you are more of an expert on the Russian front than I am, uh, you can put a clear border to what is, what is permitted and what isn't. But definitely there is a limit to, even to freedom of speech, even to freedom, you know, of, of uh, uh, to, to the free flow of scientific. This is ideally, this is an ideal. We should, of course, uh, um, be uh, directing ourselves towards, but not blindly. Not the freedom to lie. Not the freedom to misinform. Not the freedom to incite. There has to be a, a limit that we set to protect our democracy. The dem a democracy has to protect itself, and the scientific world, the academic world, has to defend itself against forces that are trying to attack it. Um, but definitely, I want to say, uh, at the end of the day, the challenges are, uh, th this may interest the media, but these are not the main challenges uh, of uh, a country uh, under attack. Uh, perhaps this is the same for you. For us now, I can say in the past weeks, uh, first of all, the in, in many of our international students in the labs in Israel have left Israel. Uh, some have still stayed. Uh, our young scientists have been recruited to the uh, army now to reserve duty. Uh, schools have stopped operating and are now only starting to operate and only partially uh, because uh, they need to have protected spaces for the students in case rockets, because the rockets are still falling. And so uh, many of the labs are to, to different extents affected by this, depending on what, who was in the lab before, but a lot of things stopped. And here again, you need the leadership. For example, ERC, Europe decided to postpone by three weeks the deadlines of the calls for proposal. That's really, it's kudos. I mean, uh, this, uh, they postponed it not only for Israelis, by the way, they postponed it for everyone, but so that also the Israelis could take part. It's important to take such steps. There are things that can be done to make sure that these communities of scientists get a chance. And I think that Every scientist, organization, institute, and, and uh, as individuals should be on the lookout to see where they can include uh, researchers from Israel, from Ukraine, uh, from the academia, from the industry in their research today and make an active effort to do so. This would be a positive thing one can do to counter terrorism and to promise that uh, this scientific diplomacy goes on in the future, even while our peoples may be experiencing challenges right now in the applications, etc. Maybe I can, can add to that. I, I really like this differentiated, differentiated view on, on, on the issues we're talking about. I mean, me personally, I, I don't like Benjamin Netanyahu. I don't I like his policies, and I was rooting with the people uh, demonstrating a couple of months ago because of the, um, uh, of, of the political reforms going on there. But the question whether 
I like Israel's policy, yes or no, has no relation whatsoever to the fact that me, as a civilized human being, condemn this barbaric terroristic attack. I mean, this is not a political question, right? So, but coming back to, to, to your question, I, I think another important aspect of, of, let's say, mobility of people via, via scientific exchange. Um, because numerous studies have shown, and I think it's a common, uh, common known fact, that uh, when I spend some time in other countries and have some meaningful interaction with people from other countries, um, the likeliness of me myself being uh, xenophobic or hate-driven or narrow-minded declines very fast, right? So uh, I spent a year of my studies in, in, uh, in the United States. I was in France. I was in, in the UK. I, I, I'm pretty sure that this helped me uh, to have uh, like an open mind to other cultures. I was in the, in the south of Texas, okay? These are not across the board very well educated people with different views on the world. This is a pretty rednecky area where I was. But I learned to understand these people, where they're from, why they are voting for George W. Bush, and why they carry guns everywhere. I mean, it's a their state of mind. So that does not mean that I necessarily agree with everything they say, but I was able to like, OK, they think about it like that. OK, they were settlers in the West, and they were in danger all the time, and they need to protect the land. That's why everybody can shoot things and stuff like that. And it's, I, I understood the history, and I understood um, why they're doing things. I don't, need to dis uh, I don't need to agree with them in all, all areas, but I have an understanding. And I think if we foster this kind of mobility, I really like these um, scholarship uh, plans that you presented here. These are all little things that can help, right? One point more. Uh, you mentioned Russian scientists. Uh, I guess the issue which shall be also mentioned is uh, responsibility. So I guess uh, if uh, what Russian scientists could do is contribute to Ukrainian victory. Uh, there are many ways. From the very first days, many Ukrainian scientists, engineers, uh, started to make drones for the army. Of course, not every science is about drones, but there is always a way. And yeah, perhaps that's what they shall be doing now. Okay, I guess your question got answered. <laughs> do we have any more questions? Um, do we have any questions from the... No. Okay. Oh, there is a question over there. Yeah. So, uh, we are facing in the last couple of years um, a tendency that people believe more... Oh. Natürlich. Uh, that people believe more in uh, fake facts or alternative facts. What could scientific collaboration do to um, face that problem? Because there is more disbelief in science, and I mean, the Earth could be flat. We don't know what <coughs> la da di da. Um, yeah, how could scientific collaboration help the whole world to get past that point and to get past uh, a not liberal? world who would like to maybe um I, sorry but can can i answer just like although i'm not really supposed to answer any questions but you know we are the berlin science week <laughs> and it's funded by the berlin senate so <laughs> maybe that's one of the ways <laughs> just want to throw it in here but uh yeah sorry go ahead I just thought that the very fake uh, fact, fake fact now, like a fake narrative, well, the whole Russian war against Ukraine is based on that Ukrainian nation doesn't exist. And people in Russia do believe this. Uh, what could we do? We could, of course, promote, uh, first of all, we should win the war to make uh, Russia change, to make it free, to, uh, to make their uh, space for free thoughts for real science because nowadays the main scientist in Russia is called Putin who just writes an article about the unity of Ukrainian, Russian and Belarusian uh, nations and then starts the war. I think look at this place 
look at this museum, look at the, what they do to, to uh, bring to the children, the, um, uh, bring, they, the children can learn here a lot about natural science, they can learn about climate change, they, they can uh, learn about um, facts, so maybe they won't, um, won't believe uh, um, these bullshit in the future. <laughs> And um, so that's a place. That's a place um, where all this is done. What we need uh, about communication of science. Can I add? Uh, so first of all, thank you for this question because I think it's a very important issue. I mean, there's like 20 or 30 percent even of people who don't really believe in science anymore or are skeptic. I don't know how this is measured, but it's not just a couple of lunatics, but quite quite a significant number of people. I think the the, the answer to this to this question is not an easy one. I think there's numerous factors coming together. One of which is certainly um, the there's still not really understood phenomena of, of people multiplying in social media um, that have an audience that's not really connected to any kind of skill, authority, or any kind of background. So somehow, people who have very obscure thoughts gain a lot of audience. I, I would love to see this explored and scientifically analyzed. But I can tell you one thing, what I'm sure about how to, how to tackle this. I think it's about a new approach to, to science in general. As we see here in the Science Week, as we see in this beautiful museum, we talked about it two days ago with the director here in the first, in the first row, you need to spark curiosity, right? You have to do it in the schools, you have to do it continuously, you have to do it on all kinds of levels. It's not about reducing complexity or anything like this. Science starts at a very, very basic level, uh, observing a bug as a little child, or looking in the sky yeah. and seeing the clouds. I mean, these are the first steps towards seeing, explaining, understanding, all right? This is basically science. Everybody does it every day. There's no like red line. Now you have a PhD, now you do science. No, it's not. As soon as you start to hear or see something and have some thoughts about it and talk to other people and combine it, then you're doing, uh, you're doing some, some kind of scientific or knowledge uh, extraction from the world. So that means if we rethink our efforts of science communication uh, in a way that is more centered around the curiosity or driving the curiosity of the audience, listening to the questions and then providing answers. That would be something in tendency, I think at least, would, would help in these matters. And that's why Falling Walls, and, uh, with, uh, heavily supported by, by the municipality and the state of Berlin, is doing this here. But it's a very important issue. We could do more, you're right. And uh, from an international perspective, obviously, it's always very nice to, to go to a conference or uh, a science fair or something like that in other countries and exchange strategies or ideas. Ah, you're doing it like this. Ah, oh, we have this boat who brings science uh, in rivers and uh, other people from other countries come and say, ah, oh, that's very interesting. We could do it as well and learn from each other. Obviously, that's, that's always nice in, in an international scenario. That's why we're so happy that there are so many international guests with falling walls and here in this Berlin Science Week. That's why we're doing this in English, by the way. <laughs> yeah, just to say, really, uh, Berlin Science Week is a wonderful event. Uh, I personally bring my uh, kids to, uh, uh, to, to the events to uh, um, try and encourage them also to curiosity. Uh, also, it's already been said, critical thinking about the, your sources is very important. Uh, and. Um, yeah, just to say this year we had in plan to actually go ahead with a format we use in Israel for science communication, which is uh, called Science on the Bar. Uh, this nice. is something that ha uh, started in Tel Aviv, uh, where uh, scientists, actually in, in Israel, scientists as part of their scientific education are also taught scientific communication to speak about their research to the general public in terms that can be uh, understood and that arouse curiosity and uh, uh, an engagement, and uh, so uh, scientists come in these uh, in Israel on in, in the framework of this event of science on the bar. They come to bars, and people just come and have a drink and listen to them talking about their research. And we were going to do that this year um, with a few duos of Israeli and German scientists to speak about their um, their joint work in quantum around censoring, and also uh, with marine research. Um, 
the events in Israel now uh, had us cancel three out of four of the events. Uh, the remaining one will still take place uh, because the scientists couldn't leave their families and come or uh, and other difficulties. But hopefully uh, next year we will be uh, already in a, a in a good stable situation again and we'll, we'll be able to uh, um, to uh, bring our plans back again to uh, make them happen. And then you all are all invited to come in here. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. And this is also very good as a concluding remark, the promise of participating in Berlin Science Week 24 as well. <laughs> That's very good. I would like to ask as one last uh, round of like, what would you like the audience like take home message like from this discussion? Maybe starting here. Okay, then. Mm. Uh, there's, uh, there's one question. Okay, well, let's see. Okay, one more question can do that. Okay, but do you really think it's enough? Because I mean, we have governments who are, um, who are paying more money for weapons and war than they pay for education. We have governments who um, are more interested to make their politic by feelings and by hate than giving good solutions. What I realized in the last couple of weeks is that science actually gives us a lot of answers to problems we are facing, but nowadays politicians are not really interested in use those solutions, but rather go with, um, let's say, not so good solutions, like in Berlin, for example, that we stopped every uh, bicycle lane just for having more um, uh, space for cars, which is, I don't know if that's a really good thing. So what can science do? What can science, uh, scientific collaboration do to make sure that politicians listen more to um, solutions of problems um, yeah, they've already found? Yeah. Well, probably Ina Chibora wants to answer this one, but just, just, one, just one little remark. Um, my experience in talking to politicians is not that they are themselves not curious and not willing to, to, to listen to scientific explanation to issues. We're still a democracy, right? So they have to listen to the people, right? So, and if we are not able to bring the insights that science provides via adequate science communication and education to a very broad audience, it's not only the responsibility of the politicians to, to do the right thing, but it's also the responsibility of all us, the people, to take a couple of minutes every day, I don't know, and to maybe read into something or inform yourself about something and keep up with new technology, keep up and, and uh, utilize these, these numerous uh, offers from, from the science world that we want to explain all the time. So we're looking for, for audience to, to take it up. So I would hand this question back to you, to everybody here. What can I do to, to spark curiosity? What can I do? When was the last time I read through some article about something I did not know yet? Right? When did I take my time not scrolling through social media pictures, but maybe reading a little more in depth into, I don't know what, right? some, some, some nature phenomenon? Okay? but I'm pretty sure you want to talk to the politician here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, um, there are lots of solutions in science, that's clear. But maybe we have um, sometimes um, the solutions are a bit isolated. Uh, we need more um, transdisciplinary um, um, solutions, I think. We, we have to think political solutions broader than only um, technical solutions. We have to think about finance, we have to think about how uh, could solutions be accepted, um, how we take all the people with us on the way to, to realize these solutions and bring them on the streets. And maybe um, that's um, there. We have to. Um, that's all. Um, our thinking is not um, um, transdisciplinary enough um, between politics and science um, to to bring these solutions into reality. 
And um, so we have, um, I'm thinking of um, um, Heizungsgesetz. <laughs> Uh, as an, one example where the solution is only technical but not um, uh, it was not um, enough thought about acceptance and how to get that acceptance so maybe that's uh, one answer to your question maybe if I can add uh, there was COVID that we were dealing with a while ago and uh, this was a time uh, when actually uh, scientists could really uh, significantly inform political, political decisions that were needed to be made. In, and I think that uh, uh, being here as a diplomat, uh, looking at the way Germany and Israel worked on this, and both countries leaned heavily on the scientists, uh, there was, uh, at least in Israel, unprecedented cooperation between scientists and uh, civil service, even not only politics, to uh, really make po uh, sci scientifically fact-based uh, policy that, uh, it, to the best, you know, uh, we made mistakes for sure along the way in terms of how the governments acted, and, but we tried to be as close as possible to the facts. Uh, I think it was an important milestone in the development of this interface between uh, uh, politics, government, and uh, science. And uh, I, I think that uh, and also, actually, there was a very good exchange between Israel and Germany in what, whatever science we had in Israel, uh, we helped Germany with and vice versa. The sharing of knowledge was crucial, uh, also across boundaries. And finally, I would say, um, that uh, uh, this, the topic of prioritizing the, uh, wh whatever resources you have and allocating them, it's not easy, but as uh, referred in a democracy, uh, the governments listen to the people. And so if you think that something is not done enough and you want more to be done, you can take it on. You have a voice. Very nice. Uh, but we're still having to do, going to do the round of conclusion, conclusions. So, <laughs> and next, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, as uh, Berlin Science Week 2024 was already uh, advertised, let me advertise another event that would uh, would be happy to engage a lot of scientists around the world in 2024, and happening also in Berlin. It will be Ukraine Recovery Conference, uh, which happens every year in another capital. It, w it used to be Ukraine Reforms Conference, but now uh, the main I well, now it has to be trans it had to be transformed, and I guess uh, recovery of Ukraine will be a great. Uh, common task where science and all the knowledge of very different uh, very different dimensions will be will be needed and what I would love to uh, to uh, uh, to say as a conclusion make science not propaganda approachable would you like to give a take home message for? <laughs> yes, I'm every day very, uh, okay, very uh, pleased, very, um, I feel, I think it great uh, to be um, a minister for higher education and I'm learning every day about solutions. Um, and um, I wish that uh, we have a better dialogue between politics and science um, to understand each other better. Often I say um, the main uh, problem is um, to find the right questions before we find the right answers. And um, that's my, my wish for science and for science diplomacy um, in Berlin and um, in the world. And I hope that science can um, contribute to rebuilding cultural heritage in Ukraine um, to, to heal um, the, um, um, okay, to heal something between, in, in the societies, between the societies. And um, yes, um, 
can help um, to um, to um, strengthen the cultural identities, even if there were crises, even if there was war, uh, especially after war, and we can contribute to, to healing the world a bit with science. I would like to connect maybe to what you said about the importance of questions and to leave you all with a question uh, related to what we talked about in terms of positive doing. Uh, and the, the question would be, what can I do for each one of you, for each one of us? What can I do uh, that is significant uh, in relation to maybe things that we've spoken about today? Uh, perhaps uh, write a letter to your local politician or a state politician or a Bund level politician uh, or to the United Nations, perhaps about the kidnapped hostages, uh, Israelis held by Hamas, or perhaps about science and the uh, uh, allocated resources. Uh, but uh, uh, don't stand by, take a stand. Think what's important to you, feel what's right, and ask yourself, what can I do today to make this world a little better? Thank you. Well, my, my wish for the, for the final remarks are quite easy. I would love everybody to be part of this movement, and it's very easy. I will give you a little tip what you can do once we're done. You are in one of the greatest and most fascinating museums of this country, okay? So maybe once you leave this, this panel here today, go around and look at something you have never looked at before and talk to somebody who's standing there that you don't know about what you see. Because then you're already first step into science diplomacy. And utilize this museum and this Berlin Science Week campus. It really is amazing. Uh, yeah, my, for my final remarks, um, I think we've learned that art and science um, both challenge our perceptions and push boundaries of what is known. And um, so just as every brush stroke on a body bear tells a story of unity and friendship, every scientific collaboration reflects humanity's shared quest for knowledge and progress and together they can paint a picture of a world where differences are celebrated. And yeah, and that's why uh, I would like to, um, together with my with, um, Berlin Science Week, I would like to invite you to join us tomorrow at Holzmarkt um, for the Body Bear Life Painting event, where we will craft a symbol of solidarity for Ukraine and um, where well, you can all be part of it. And uh, yeah, and, and especially we would like to thank you also, of course, um, the Berlin Secretary of State for International Affairs, um, Florian Hauers, who supported this event and made it, who made it possible that we can, yeah, um, do this um, together. So please come and join tomorrow. And that was it for us. Um, I, I think we could have talked forever about this topic and there are many side topics, side avenues we could go to, but okay, time is running and um, thank you, thank you very much. I think uh, it went in totally different direction as post planning, so <laughs> sorry for my, uh, yeah. Um, but it was super interesting also for me to, to hear all this and I hope also for our audiences and thank you all for the questions and for coming here and the Berlin Science Week is still going on so for another eight days, so no, six days, sorry. <laughs> um, so I hope to see you all again at different events of the Berlin Science Week and thank you online audiences. There are also more, more online events coming up so um, hope to see you all and thank you very much. Let's make this world a better place together.